are any figures and uh, patterns in front of you still distracting? Anybody had that? Okay, let's introduce a new factor. There are words of thought and the figures, the images that come that normally distract us. We are taking care of the words by repetition of other words. It helps. Let's take care of the images by contemplating an image also. An image of the master, an image of the beloved, an image of God in the form you see. Just put that image, contemplate, see that image deliberately. Put that image to block other images and put the words to block other words. Now, if you can block these two channels of distractions, it becomes easier to be there. Let's do the exercise with contemplation of the beloved's face and the repetition of words. And while we contemplate that, if the beloved's face is clear, we watch it and keep on repeating the words. If the face, if the face is not very clear, we still repeat the words till it becomes clear. Then we watch it intently and keep on repeating the words. We repeat the words and see the beloved. If it is the beloved's face and not a picture, we'll be full of love. So when we look at the face of the beloved, it should be with love and devotion. It should not be mechanically. Words should be repeated mechanically. The face should be seen with love and devotion. So see the face with love and devotion and repeat the words mechanically to keep the thoughts occupied. See if it works better. Let's do it again. Yes, any question? Pardon? The face of a beloved of yours. The master's face, a guru's face. If you have no guru, any beloved's face whom you love. Anyone, anyone you love. Whichever part you like best. I like the eyes. But the whole face automatically comes up. But the eyes are a good place to focus on. Repeat the words when you are focusing on the eyes. Now this actually makes it easier. Because now we have something to look up to. We can look at something. We can repeat the words. And still be conscious of the fact that we are doing it from the third eye center. So we're trying to use two aids in this process of meditation. If you love somebody and you don't have a master, figure the face of the beloved. If you love nobody, then figure out the face of one you would love to love. Your ideal. If you have no nobody, whoever loves you and you have not loved anybody, then contemplate on the face of the ideal. What will be the ideal face to the idea is to use it as a device again. But this time, because you are contemplating on the face of the beloved, it should be done with love and devotion and not done mechanically. A repetition of words should be done mechanically because that is to inculcate a habit of occupying the mind in that repetition, not to think of other things. But this is done with love and devotion to inculcate the mind to do it, not to stop it from doing something. So, with love and devotion, look at the face of the beloved and express your love by looking at the face while repeating the words of the mantra. Begin. Two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Look this way. Did this help? The additional input just helped to be there. Thank you. Now, any, any questions on what we are doing, what we are trying to do? We are trying to withdraw our attention from the scattering it goes through in this wide world and scattering in the body to bring it back to our own conscious self which is behind the eyes. Yes, sir. And you are withdrawing from the external world and you are focusing on an image of the beloved. Yes, the yes. Now if the image changes, the facial expression might change, the Sometimes it's an image of a picture. Other times it's, we might be trying to carve out the actual face out of the shadows of the darkness. All of that is the same. Yeah. You shouldn't like think about. I mean, when you think about carving the face out of the shadow, that you. Yeah. Sometimes you can't do what you want to. Did you notice that? Sometimes you cannot do what you intend to do. Exactly. Exactly. 
but sometimes you can. And therefore, this practice of trying to contemplate, you are trying to contemplate on a face of a person you have met. And when you try to contemplate on the face of a person you have met, it's difficult, especially, like you said, to concentrate on looking at the eyes. It's very difficult to carve out imaginatively or mentally the eyes of a perfect living master. It's easier to carve out the eyes of uh, other beloveds of this world. So, unless the grace comes and that master himself is ready to speak to us inside, we don't get the eyes. If we are not repeating the words, eyes can come. When we repeat the words, the eyes are very difficult to sculpture inside. But the point is, contemplation is taking advantage of one form to the exclusion of the other distractions. So as a starting point, it is good. This is all to start with from here. When we start from here and our withdrawal is good enough, I don't even allow a couple of minutes, two, three minutes for each exercise. The exercise should be done for 30 minutes at least. Each segment should be at least 30 minutes. And if you can make it one hour, better. If you can make it two hours, still better. Two and a half hours is prescribed, standard, one-tenth of your time. Like the tithes, one-tenth of your net income you give to charity, one-tenth of your time you should give to meditation. So if you can give two and a half hours every day, it's good. If you cannot give it at one go because you get so tired and the distraction is so heavy or your time schedule doesn't permit, break it into portions. But 30 minutes is the minimum to gather yourself together. What we are doing in this workshop is just a sampling of what can be done. And the workshop doesn't end here. It goes on with you when you go. So that you keep on trying this for 30 minute segments, the different exercises, and see how you withdraw your attention. When you withdraw your attention, you gradually begin to feel that you have no sensation in the tips of your fingers or the toes of your feet. Anybody ever had that? Okay. Anybody this side? Okay. When that happens, that only means that the scattered attention which made you aware of your body is being withdrawn. It's a physical withdrawal taking place in the body. As you concentrate your attention on being behind the eyes, the attention is being picked up from the rest of the body. And you are picking it up back to the point from where it was scattered to start with. As, as you gather this attention back behind the eyes, you feel you don't know where the body is. As soon as the attention goes above the legs and beyond the shoulders, the torso you are still aware of, but this withdrawal is enough to make you feel you don't know where you are, you are flying. You don't have to withdraw attention completely to have the experience of flying. Even halfway up when the attention is being withdrawn and you feel after 30 minutes, I don't know where my leg is. It's not that the leg becomes numb or tingling sensation, not that kind of numbness. When you don't know whether the, your leg is placed one on top of the other, whether it is uh, lying straight or not, you have to open your eyes to see where it is. When you are unaware of your extremities, that's the time when you begin to feel you're flying, you're free. And this little darkness in a small confined space which you have been calling your head becomes like a huge sky in which you can fly as long as you like. Has anybody had that? Yes, yes. Some of you have had that experience. This will come to anybody who does it. It's natural. This experience opens up the space inside and it is not the space that we are seeing outside. It is the original space. That original space creates through consciousness the experience of space outside. You will notice that the inner experiences, once they start coming up through the sensory systems, they are the ones that we use to create the space and experiences outside without knowing it. But we are taking these as real. And to begin with, we start taking them as unreal. But as we continue with the meditation of going within, the inner experience becomes more and more real and more and more at our will. So we can fly, we can see things. And when we fly, when that happens, also lights and colors of many kinds come. 
Yes. When you said when you fly, you, you say you start out with, you're in the center behind the eye. And then when you fly, are you still in the center behind the eye? Yeah. So what direction do you go? Whichever you like. When you, yes, when you fly, it, it appears you have no gravity, that you're not attached to anything. Right now, if I were to say, Sam, why don't you fly? You can't fly because you're sitting on a chair and heavy. There's no other, uh, there's no other, there is nothing else that's preventing you from flying now, except that you are heavy and tied by gravity to the earth and to the chair. When you have the experience of withdrawal of attention from the body, even halfway through, you get the experience, you are free floating. Nothing is tying you up. And that is like a feeling of flying. It's not flying with wings flapping or something, not like a bird necessarily. That you're free to go. And you, that feeling of being free then enables you to explore and you move fast. You can move fast in many directions. By that time, of course, different images and lights have come and you start seeing things which you recognize as being different, being more illuminated and being different from what you have been seeing in the physical plane. So that is the first entry, the very first exposure to an astral experience. Right. Is that my, that's not my the astral body moving. The astral body moves with the thoughts. The astral body moves only with thoughts. There's no other way to move it. You say you can feel, you can make the body sense to stay with you in the astral body. You have like an astral form that's the same as your physical form. You have fingers that are astral fingers. Yes. You actually touch with astral fingers. Yes. And with thoughts you fly, change the location. So this thing happens as a normal result of this experience of withdrawal of attention. But don't forget, it should be done 30 minutes at a time as one segment. You can break the two and a half hours into five segments or into two segments or three, but don't break them into more than five segments. Don't say, okay, 10 minutes at a time, I'll do all day long. That, uh, that may be good to satisfy you, you have done your meditation. It may be good for burning karma too, but it won't be good for getting an, ex an experiential verification of what I am saying. If you want to have an experiential verification of all that I have been telling you, then this segment should not be less than 30 minutes. It takes that much time just to gather your wits around or your attention. It's the same thing. Your wits and your attention is very similar. So to put the attention together, these are different processes we are using. To be able to hold the attention there, we have to have some activity like the one you say, contemplate, change of face. If something starts happening there, some activity starts taking place there, it becomes easier to stay on there. How, what kind of activity can one use for contemplation? If one has a master, one can use the memory of an experience with the master to generate a reliving of that memory for creating activity which holds you there. Now let's try that method. Instead of merely looking at the eyes, use memory of the beloved. In what form you saw the delightful form, form that you liked, the form that you remember, that little incident that you remember, which is so beautiful. You remember how you saw, what happened, and you can relive it in imagery. It is still the beloved, it is still the master, but instead of merely making a sculptural face and merely carving out a face to see it, now we just remember. We remember visually what happened when we saw the beloved or when we saw the master and how he turned around, how he did this, how he did that. One particular event we pick up and look at it as it happened so that we recall it. As we recall, we are filled with the joy of remembering how we were filled with the joy at that time. And that love and joy and devotion that comes by remembering that event while we are repeating the words helps us again to be at the third eye center. Sometimes this is an easier method than even having to contemplate a picture form. Let's try that. Is it easy? Can you all remember some incident? You all remember some incident which made you happy? Which made you high? Okay, now use that incident and use it to relive it. While doing it, repeat the mantra, repeat the words slowly, deliberately listening to it. Please begin. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes.
Was this better? Did anybody find better? Please raise your hand, those who found this exercise better. Thank you. These are different devices. Now, while we are using these different methods, they are all methods, devices. They are not, they are not rites or ceremonies or any essential part of any spiritual practice. These are different common sense devices in order to be within our own selves. To sit at peace with our own selves instead of having scattered thoughts going all over. So far, whatever we are trying to do is just to bring a peaceful withdrawal to our own self for a while. Let's see what it is to be with oneself. And better still, if we are with the beloved, with love and devotion, with that attitude, how can we be inside? This is all we are trying to do. While we are doing that, sometimes we begin to hear some kind of a sound or a note. Like there is a sound going on, that there is a sha sha going on, and there is a bell sound or a cricket sound, a different kind of sound start coming in, which are not external sounds. They are coming in while we are inside, while we are inside the head. Anybody ever experienced these sounds coming in? Many of you have. Okay. When these sounds start appearing, which are not outside, because listening to the sound automatically brings you to yourself. It's the easiest way to gather your attention to the third eye center. The rest of what I spoke all day long was to reach a point where we can hear some sound. When the sound comes, resonance inside, when that resonance and sound is inside, that is the resonance of the self. If we listen to that sound, automatically we will be withdrawn. If the sound becomes purer and clearer, it will turn out to be like the sound of a big bell. Gong, gong. It will take that ultimate sound. But before that, it can take sound of little bells in the distance or some kind of a echo sound or sound of crickets in the, in the, in the field or in the yard or sound of waterfall or a train. Uh, crossing over a bridge, a different kind of sounds come, combination. Many of them have an origin in the physical systems also, like blood vessels. When we concentrate attention, the blood vessels, the breathing, you can hear many things. But these subtle sounds, which are very sweet, melodious, when these sounds appear, then we have reached a point in our meditation where we can give up everything and hold on to the sound. After that, if you can hold on regularly to the sound without problem, that you go quickly to the stage where you can hear the sound and begin listening with love and devotion for the sound. The sound pulls us to the higher regions. We don't need any other aid after that. The sound is the secret. Yes. When you're talking about this sound, does this have, can this tie into when we hear a song or some kind of song and, and it just keeps recurring, it may pop up in our head, inside us? No. Or... A song is like a thought, like a memory. I am talking of a sound which is not a memory. It is not a sound that we heard and we are hearing it now. That's a memory. This is a sound that has got a quality of persistence, a quality of continuity, a sound that is evolving, becoming louder if you listen and fading if you don't. So it's not a memory. Any other question about the sound? If, uh, if you listen to the sound, you're listening to the sound your mind takes you different places. Yeah. Is that alright? Yeah. 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 If you're listening to the sound and the sound is not strong enough to keep you in the place where you're listening and the mind starts taking you out, Start repetition again. Repetition should be used, repetition of the mantra of the word should be used as long as you are not stabilized at the third eye center and the sound can pick you up. Use one or the other till you are stable at the third eye center and the sound can draw you in. Right. If you are visualizing other things and listening to the sound, you try to get the form of the master, so you're, that's all you Right. When you are thinking of other things, use repetition. 
when you're seeing other things, use the visualization of the master. When the sound is strong enough that you don't want to think of anything else or see anything, listen to the sound alone. Why are you listening to the sound? What will you be saying? Whatever comes, you will see. You won't pay attention. Right now, what are you seeing? But there are so many others too. It depends on what you're paying attention to. So seeing is not automatic. Seeing will automatically pick up what your attention is taking you to. You must say you can be totally engrossed in hearing the sound and not see anything or not be conscious that you're seeing anything. To start, it looks theoretically like that. Now I'll tell you what happens practically. Practically you start seeing the sound. It is so radiant. It's full of its own light. As you will listen to the sound, the sound will have not only emitting its melody and the sound tone and the beautiful <clears throat> musical resonance in it, it will also emit the lights and the colors and you will know it's coming from the same sound. It will move, go around you, circle you, occupy you and it will go louder and brighter. So automatically the sound will become a companion. So it will not be a sound anymore after a while, it will become a being. Any question here? Okay, now many of you have heard the sound, so that's good. It's a good beginning. Those who have heard the sound in the next exercise will concentrate their attention on listening to the sound and see how it grows. Forget the rest. If the sound is audible, if you can hear the sound, concentrate on listening intently. Again, the principle is the same. The more intently you listen to the sound coming from within, the more you are going and being pulled to your own self within. The sound is the best way to go within. The perfect living masters have called this sound as the royal road to spiritual heaven. All other roads are rough roads. This is the royal road. It's the most natural road. Nobody has planted this sound in you. There is no tape recorder being planted. There is no musical instrument being planted. It is natural. It's coming from the consciousness, the self, the soul. This is soul music. It's coming from within. Not that kind of soul music. This is the real soul music. This is what people wanted to start with. This is what the Greeks talked of. This is what people talked of 10,000 years ago. They said, if you want to hear, hear the nod, the unending music, the anhad shabat, the word that was in the beginning, the song that created everything, the melodies, the resonance that sustains creation. They talked of that sound. We all want to listen to that sound. That's soul music. And we went into all kinds of you know what. <laughs> So we have to get back to the original sound of the soul. It has been placed there not by any religion, not by any cult, not by any master, not by any guru, not by us. It has been placed within us by the creator. The one who made the creation also made this. And it is concealed. It is center of the self. It is the secret of our own self. It is the manifestation of the self Whereas the creation around us, the experiences around us, around are the manifestation of experience. This is the manifestation of the experiencer. So getting to the sound is getting to yourself because it is coming from within. So the sound is the key. And putting your attention on the sound constitutes the highest yoga that we know of. Anybody tells me higher yoga, I'll accept it. This is the highest we heard. It's called the Surt Shabd Yoga. The yoga of placing Surt or your attention on the Shabd or the sound and then having union with the reality or God. Yes. This is a question for someone else. You um, said it's the royal road. When does it become the only road? I don't know. I am, uh, I am shown so many roads. When I got initiated by my master, the great master, he gave me an instruction, which I took it very seriously. He said, go around in this world. I am telling you the way, the royal road. That's what the master said. I am sharing with you the royal road, which my master gave me. It worked for me. It's done a good job. I hope it works for you. If somebody else offers you a better road to go on, go on that. Take that road. Follow it and see how it goes. If it goes further and better, take it. Don't come to ask my permission. First go and take it. Then come back and tell me, so I may also go and follow that road. 
When he said this instruction to me, why should I be so dogmatic and bigoted to say I have the only road? I went to, I went to a class to examine comparative religion in this university right here in Cambridge. And it was a strange thing. It was not part of my course in economics, but I just had interest. And I studied the Vedas, I studied all other religions. And I was surprised to find when I studied different denominations of Christianity and different denominations of Buddhism, the, the higher vehicle, the lower vehicle, I studied all of them. They studied different phases of Hinduism, the different phases of uh, Shintoism. When I studied the oldest religions and compared them and talked to those people who are considered to be the teachers and masters of those different religions, different groups and different cults, I found they were teaching different things. Though the texts were all emphasizing that the truth is within. I didn't find any text which said the truth is outside. They all said the truth is within. But they were teaching in such a way that I couldn't see what was the common thing. So I tried to find out if there was a common feature in all these groups that were teaching how to go within. And one common sentence I found in all of them. Ours is the only way. I got alarmed. That's the only common feature. Each one claiming ours is the only way. I decided never to say that again. Even then, when you ask this question. When you become close-minded, maybe you don't have the most perfect thing. Somebody else can come up and show a better road. Take it. I am willing to take it today. Somebody comes up and shows me a better road, better than the royal road I found out of the tension on the inner sound, taking to the highest level, level after level. Anything better than that? Show me. I'll take it. I'll go back to great master and tell him to take it too. <laughs> Therefore, let's not get into this closed vocabulary that this is the only way. Why do you want the only way? Take the royal way. It's better than the only way. It's royal. It's comfortable. It's good. It's natural. And you can hear the sound as you hear the sound and its beauty. And as the self hears the self, you rise in consciousness. Now, I have been talking about something. People may wonder, why do we want to do this? What's the big idea? Okay, you hear the sound, so what? Okay, you want to go to higher regions, so what? What are you getting? What are you achieving? Well, <clears throat> depends on what your goals are. Somebody says, I am tired of this terrible, lonely, unhappy world. Okay, this is the answer to that. Somebody says, I am full of curiosity. I never get, my, get all my answers. I get contradictions. All right, here's the way. You'll get perfect answers to your satisfaction. Somebody says, I love flying in the sky. Okay, here's the way. You'll get it. Somebody says, I want to know all about my past lives. I can't help it. Nobody tells me clearly. I want to see them myself. All right, here's the way. People have their own goals. Somebody says, I want none of this. I just want to be with my real creator. Be one with the creator. All right, this is the way. You set your goal and this is the way. So it is the royal way. If there's another way, tell me. Better. It should be a better way. If it is a rough road, I'll rather take the royal road. The road of the sound current. The sound current. This, <clears throat> why is it sound? I surprised my friend Clarence Brinson the other day. After so many years of association with me, he still thought I was talking of a sound. If the sound of bells is all we are going to hear inside, I won't go for it. I can create good bells outside. I can buy them too. Very good ones. <laughs> and now there is new, new digital equipment that can create any sound outside. If all that we are trying to do meditation for is to hear a sound, according to me, it's not worthwhile. We can get it right outside cheaply without all this trauma of saying how to withdraw attention, not even knowing what we are talking about. Trying to experience this trauma till we get make it. This sound I am talking of is the creator. This sound I am talking of is the core of consciousness. This sound makes us conscious. This sound sustains any conscious experience including the experience of this world. 
the sound were not there, we couldn't hear this world. We cannot hear this world, we cannot see it. I'll tell you a little secret, how this sensory apparatus operates, which we, we look at a thing, say, there is a cup of water. Do you know our mind, using the sensory apparatus and connotation of these sounds called words, says this is a cup of water. When it says this in our head, we see the cup of water. Supposing it doesn't say so, we don't see it. Did you ever know that? That's how the brain functions. There are plenty of evidence on that. That the brain works in certain grooves. The sensory perceptions themselves are a bizarre mixture of colors, deep and different. They are just, they are just twisting the tail of the rods and cones. Nothing else. They are very, very crude stimuli that create a bizarre kind of sensory input. It doesn't make any sense at all. Till the mind interprets them by telling us what it is. And the mind tells us based upon our connotations built up in the subconscious over a long period of time, several lifetimes. The genetic code holds the entire configuration. Whatever is happening at the causal and astral region is also being recorded in the physical right now. And every single cell in the physical body contains the complete record. Not only of the individual, but of the entire Akashic record themselves. Every physical cell in our body contains the entire record of everybody, ever born or will be born, physically. So what are we talking about? We are not talking of seeing, we are talking always of hearing. The highest device for experience has been listening. That is why these masters, when they found out how creation took place, they said what was the beginning of creation? Not a creator, before the creator. What was really the creator? In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. What kind of word? What kind of word are we speaking of? That was there in the beginning and you have to state that even before you state there was a God. Saint John was not talking of a sound or a spoken word, obviously. He was talking of the power, the creative power, which for want of any other word, we are calling it the word. Why should the Vedas, the Rig Veda, talking of the creation of this entire universe, talk of the sound that struck that music that led to all experience. The sound that generated the ability to hear. Not the sound that could be heard. The sound that created the ability to hear. The sound that was the creator of consciousness. We are not talking of an ordinary sound. We are talking of a sound that was there in the beginning. A sound that stretches all the way and creates the persistence of the self. If you were to ask me one good definition, how do we know it is the same sound? It changes. When we listen to it, it looks like one kind of sound. We listen more, it changes. Eventually it becomes like a bell, then it becomes like a gong, then it becomes like, like other instruments that we have heard. Like the conch they blow, the shell. You know the shell they blow? A long sound and it becomes like that. The same, same sound is going on changing. How can it be? A reality, if it changes, what is the permanency of the sound? The permanency of the sound is that it carries with it the experience of the self. The form may change, the self doesn't change. For example, supposing like uh, Fan Hu, the Chinese philosopher. Fan Hu had a dream. Fan Hu, I've invented a name. Fan Hu, the Chinese philosopher had a dream that he was a butterfly. And he dreamt that he was flying from flower to flower. And it was beautiful. And as a butterfly with his wings flapping, he flew from flower to flower. The garden was beautiful. And then he woke up. But when he woke up, he wondered, is he in truth a butterfly dreaming that he is Fan Hu, the philosopher? Or is he Fan Hu? the philosopher who had a dream that he was a butterfly. How will he get the answer? What is the link between the two? Why should he question if he was the butterfly? He had to put this question to himself because he did not see a butterfly flying in the garden. 
he was flying as a butterfly. He did not see a philosopher called Fan Hu. He was the philosopher Fan Hu. And he knew the same he who was the Fan Hu was the same he who was the butterfly. So change of form from butterfly to philosopher made no difference to the singular unity of the self. We can change any forms. We can be in the astral form with similar hands and fingers like these. We can be in the causal form with no hands and fingers at all and no sensory perceptions. We can be just light, which is invisible in the Pardram stage beyond the mind. We can be in the stage of totality where there is no form at all. Yet it's the same self all the time. The experience of being in different stages is going to the same self and the same self in memory can link it all up as the same self. There's only one self. It is this persistence of the self. What is creating the persistence of the same self irrespective of level of consciousness, irrespective of form? This sound, the word, the shabad. Don't take it as ordinary music. It's not an ordinary song. It is the resonance of consciousness. It is the resonance of the self. And when we listen to it, in whatever form it comes, and even if the form changes, if we listen to it, we are drawn to a higher and higher nature of our own self, higher and higher level of our own self, because we are going closer and closer to the center of our own self. That's the whole secret. The secret of the Sutta Shabda Yoga, the yoga of the attention and the sound, is that the attention can be focused on the center of the sound and take you to the highest stage possible. If anybody has a yoga that takes you further, I'll be the first one to embrace it. I'll be the first one to take it up. The great master threw a challenge to me. He said, go around the world. At that time, I didn't know how many times I'll go around the world. I didn't know in, in a few years, I'll travel 40, 50, 60 times around the world. I didn't know that. He said, go around the world and see if you can find something better. If you can't take it, then come back. I went, I took him so seriously that not only did I wait passively, if something will come my way, I went actively to see if there is something better. Went everywhere, explored, sat with all kinds of people in the hippie days, <laughs> in the old days of Timothy Leary and Alpert here, Ram Das, Baba, in this area. I went through all those phases, traveled in various places, border of Tibet, I went to the mountains, to the Tibetan mountains, to the Himalayas, went everywhere. Not only did I not find a perfect master giving me anything beyond what the sound was giving. What the great master gave. I did not find anybody even describing this in words to me. And when I tried to describe them, they said, what are you talking about? We didn't hear about it. This is so high, we never heard of it. So what I am talking of, the sound is something way beyond the physical sounds that we talk of. But it looks like, sounds like, a physical sound to start with, which is lucky for us. But then we can, what do they call, uh, hook your wagon? Hitch your wagon. Hitch your, wagon hitch your wagon to a star. We can hitch our wagon to the sound. So we can, by focusing on the sound and listening to it, get more rapid withdrawal than by the other means I was talking of earlier. So other means of meditation are means to reach this point when you are in contact with your own resonance. When you are in contact with your own resonance, that's enough to pull you. If it, if it is not strong enough at that point, go back to the other methods. And when you get back, again it will pull you. And one of the things that helps in this process is initiation by a perfect living master. What is initiation by a perfect living master? How does a perfect living master initiate us? He marks us as marked sheep even before we are born. So our life is cast like that and our destiny brings us through coincidence with a person who turns out to be that person. We don't even know half the time. When the time is right, we know it. So the life starts changing. A lot of strange coincidences start happening around that time. So we, we, we can't figure out this wasn't happening. How come we are running into these people at this time? How come these books have come into my hand at this time? How come I'm thinking about this time? A series of them happen. And then we are face to face. The perfect living master. But we are not sure. So we go through several phases. Eventually, we end up with a perfect living master. Then comes the next step, initiation. 
He introduces us to his subject. He introduces us and we know something is going on. We are very happy. The more we meet, the happier we get, the more love and dev devotion develops. But when he gives us the method, he initiates us. And outwardly, we feel he has only given us some words to repeat like a mantra. Told us how to hear the sound. Told us some techniques, physical techniques. But that is not initiation. That is the external form of initiation. The actual initiation is that he connects our attention permanently to the sound at the point where he is operating as the master in this world. And that connection which he establishes makes it much easier to hear the sound, get on to it and follow the path, path of the royal road of Sruti Shabd Yoga. So initiation is very important from that point to go to the highest levels. Another feature of this connection that he makes at initiation is that he is there in his astral form, waiting for us there. If we do the first stage of our duty of meditation and go within, we, when we see the light coming, we see his form and we call it the radiant form. Why do we call it radiant form? Because it radiates light. It radiates light and is so beautiful and is so attractive that light pulls us that light makes us feel that it's not only light, the physical light flowing, it is love and light both flowing. And we bathe in it and enjoy it. And after that, the perfect living master is a constant companion at every level of consciousness that we go. We never go alone. At that moment, for the first time, one can say, my loneliness has ended. Otherwise, we are lonely till that point. In this world, you can have as many friends as you like. You can make one, break one, have one, two, three, company, big company, big parties, are lonely. I've seen that. I watched people closely. Even in the midst of a crowd, they are lonely because they feel nobody understands them. And there is nobody understanding them. At the radiant form, when one comes across the master, one ultimately ends loneliness. There is no loneliness after that. There's always a companionship. And that companionship is not that you have to run for that companionship. It's with you all the time. Wherever you go, you are never alone anywhere in any universe, even this planet and this earth. You can walk around and be with the master all the time. This is a royal road where you can get this kind of true friendship. And the master, whether we see him in the physical form as a human being, or we see him in the radiant form inside, gives us what I might describe from my experience as unconditional love. I haven't found that in this world. People talk of unconditional love and they attach conditions. They say, if you do this for me, I'll give you unconditional love. They're just using a word. What have you done for me lately? <laughs> the question is always conditions, conditions, conditions. If you don't meet the conditions, there is no love. You didn't do that. Now I don't love you, I hate you. Here is a relationship the only true relationship which is unconditional. And great master used to say, look around in this world, is there some anything worth loving and worth worshipping? We said, why do you put the two words together? He said, because people can worship and not love or people can love and not worship. We love a lot of people and we don't worship and we are disappointed. We worship people and we have no love, we are only fear. It has to be combination. Is there something worth loving and worshipping in this world? If you look around from the birds and the trees and the animals and the angels and the pictures and the friends we have and the human beings and we look at all of them and one by one we rule them out. Except a human friend. Is if we could have a perfect friend, if we could have a perfect human friend, that would be worth loving and worshipping. Then the question is, why should you worship a human being, especially in a democracy like United States? Here it won't count. You can't worship. All are equal. All are equal. How can you worship, put somebody on a pedestal and consider somebody superior? Why loving? Loving is all equal. Now, this is a big clash. Many societies collectively have stumbled upon this rock in front of them and they don't move. They say, no, no, how is it possible? Only a human being is worth loving and worshipping. And why should we love another human being 
and we are also human and have the same qualities. The great master used to say, that's a very good question. He was not referring only to the seekers in the United States. He was saying as universally, it's a good question. And he gave the answer that if you place a large number of radio sets on a table and say all the radios are the same, they all look the same, little variation in their face, little variation in their knobs and, and valves and uh, transistors. If you put all of them together, but disconnect them from the batteries and disconnect them from the power source, they all still look the same. If you connect one of them with the power source, that alone will give you the news of the world. Looks don't matter. Connection matters. Similarly, human beings are there. They all look alike. They are all the same. They all have their voting, same voting rights. They all have the same right to claim equality. But the one who is connected in consciousness to the higher level alone will give you the music that can take you to the higher level. Therefore, such a one is different and is worth loving and worshipping. This is where we, uh, we got stuck and he helped us to pass the hump and go over, move on. Otherwise, we want to find our own imaginary God. We are content with the concept of God just because we cannot accept the equality of a human being. We treat an equal, e equal human being because he is equal as unqualified. And therefore, we must find a concept which cannot help us as superior and stay with the concept rather than go with the human being. It's a, it's a big wall. It's a big obstacle we have created. So the masters have tried to take us out of that. How do they do it? They come without imposing themselves on us. They come as ordinary friends. They don't claim they are masters. They don't come and say, we are the masters, come on. We have come to save your souls. They come like ordinary people and we kill them. And they get killed, crucified. They do ordinary things. But they do for the marked sheep miracles. Private miracles which create a faith in the disciple that nothing else can create. They create a coincidence which could not have happened. They create changes in life which could not have taken place. And that individual is sure he's met the right person. But when he shares it with friends and others, they say, no, no, this is just a coincidence, a chance thing. Why are you giving it so much attention? So they pick and choose the marked sheep in order to take them to the inner music and the inner sound. This is how it operates. And we are lucky that they are always there. It's lucky that the visit of the master is not a one-time affair. It's always there. We'll always be there. If masters were not there upon this earth, we would have burnt ourselves long ago by now. It's the masters and the connection with the creator that keeps the show going and sustained. They bring love, compassion, peace upon this earth. We and with our minds are ready to burn it up, to be violent, to kill and to hate. They turn us into love and peace and beauty and joy. Therefore, this word I speak of is the real form of the master. If somebody were to ask me, who is the living master? The living master is the word, the music within. Why can't we directly go to the music and find our master? Because we don't know how. Who can tell us? One who is hearing this music. Who is hearing all the time? That human being who is in constant touch. What is his real form? The same music. So this Shabbat, this music is the real form of the master. We, since we cannot hear, it is expressed in the form of a human being who becomes our friend, puts us in touch with the same sound, and the same sound becomes the experience of the radiant form of the master with it. And having been connected with that, we go on the royal road all the way back to the highest level of consciousness. Let's do the exercise. For those who can hear the sound, just hitch your wagon to the sound, which means put your attention on the sound. Those who cannot yet hear, repeat the words and listen to the mantra, to the words with such intensity that behind the words they can hear the music also coming. When the music comes, when the sound comes behind the words, give up the words. Listen to the music. If the music fades out, get back to the words. Use the words as a stepping stone for the music. And with love and devotion, listen to it. The music comes, listen to it with love and devotion. It is the real, permanent self and the permanent form 
of the inner mast. Close your eyes and begin. Keep your eyes closed till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Have I called you out too quickly? Yeah. Anybody was enjoying this? You didn't want to be pulled out? Thank you. I am sorry to pull you out. The constraints of this timing of the workshop uh, give me only little time to let you sample the kind of experiences one goes through. It's a very simple process. It's not a complicated yoga. It's very simple. Anybody can do it from a child of five years to an old man of 100 years. It, there's no restriction except improve your diet because the kind of food you eat makes concentration difficult. Be a vegetarian. Destroy life at the lowest level of distributed consciousness. Plants and so on. You have to kill life. There's no way. All life is surviving on life. If you look around in this physical world, life thrives on life. Every living thing is killing some other living thing. Even plants have life and we kill them. But in terms of the levels of consciousness, the plants uh, figure at the lowest distributed consciousness. So they are going through a phase in which uh, their will and their consciousness is at the lowest level. So it's only a recommended diet that we vegetarians don't drink liquor, alcohol, don't take drugs, don't take narcotics. None of these have very simple life. Don't express hatred to anybody. Have a loving attitude towards people. Try to understand them. Put yourself in their place in day-to-day -day life. Don't try to take from people. Rather be a giver. Give to people rather than take. Modify your lifestyle to so such an extent that your karma becomes less heavy and your meditation will succeed more. If you create this environment, you'll have more successful meditation and you will be able to find that at a certain time, you'll get these different stages I've spoken of. Many of you are initiated by a perfect living master. All of you that I can see, we see clearly. All of you are marked sheep of some perfect living master of the earth. It's very lucky. Congratulations. And you will all in due course get initiation from a perfect living master. Not necessarily the same master, but you are earmarked to get from a perfect living master. The seeking is deep in your heart. You don't have to tell anyone about it. When you seek, seek inside. It's not necessary to cry out physically. If you want to cry out for help, cry out inside. The masters I am talking of hear you even if they are far away. They don't have to be physically close to listen to you. They listen to you from the voice in your own heart. So therefore, you are very lucky, this group, and you will all get initiation in time, those who haven't got. Those who are initiated, Please use that opportunity to do meditation regularly with love and devotion. Don't do it mechanically. Do it with love and devotion. The key is the more you do it with love and devotion, the more progress you will make. The more you do it mechanically, the more you'll be trapped by the mind's observation on what you are doing. It's very simple. It's not a mind's game. It's not a mental game. It's a spiritual game of the heart. And those who are not yet initiated, prepare yourself by sitting at the third eye center. When you will get initiated, you will have a head start and move on. The truth is all inside you. It's not outside. Whoever says it's outside, don't listen. Whoever says inside, follow. But don't follow by going after that person. Follow by going inside. Follow what he says. Don't follow the person. Follow what he's saying. Do that what the person is saying inside, within your own self. I enjoyed this workshop with you. I hope you enjoyed too. If there's any last minute question, we're we'll very happy to answer. And there are some interviews fixed uh, after this. Uh, we had eight slots. You were able to increase two or unslotted people. <laughs> we'll try to fit them in. Some people have very short interview. Some people have interviewed with me and they're quite happy. I notice from their face and from what they say. They just come. They say, we have nothing to ask. Thank you. I'm not suggesting that you should all do that, but, <laughs> but I had that experience many times and they get their answers. Some of you heard me talking about Linda Goodman at the lunch table. Linda Goodman was perfectly happy to hear me say, hmm, 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 three times. She got all the answers she wanted in that. So it is not how many words we use, but uh, we'll try to accommodate all the 10 here. 
And some of you are going to Hartford. Anybody going to Hartford? Okay. So if uh, somebody misses out an interview here, uh, I think uh, uh, Michelle told me she's going to arrange a few slots of interviews there also. So you can have a meeting there if you want. Give her the name. If we run out from here, you take them in such an order. Those who are going to Hartford will come last. It doesn't mean, last does not mean last in terms of worth. <laughs> Sometimes those who come last come first. Uh, uh, any last minute question? Yes. You want to give time to him? Okay. <laughs> he surrenders his time to you. Um, the, uh, as you pulled us out, uh, pulled us out from meditation, the sound, the sound is still there. It's always there. The, the, it's our attention that, that has been probed to a, yes. a new area. Yes. Barrier. Yes. When the sound becomes pure and real, it will always be there whether in meditation or not, always 24 hours. It will never go. It's our constant companion. Yes? Okay, yeah, first, because it's the same kind of question. The sound current is continuous. Yes. Said the higher sounds, the gong and the conch and the bell sound, are continuous sounds that have causes. Like ball, ball. Yes. Ball the yes. Does that mean that this, this it doesn't have a pause. It has what is called a sine curve in its rhythm. The rhythm is there, but the sound is continuous. So you should try to listen for this, for the, for the, what's the, what's the expression, the, the one that goes like that, you should listen for that. Right? Yeah, you should listen to that automatically. What will happen will be, I'll, if I can explain in a, in a simpler way, when you hear the sound of the little bell, it'll, when you listen to it, automatically it will start changing. Ting, ting, and it becomes elongated. Each peel, what they call the peel of a sound. When the big gong starts, it doesn't start almost from there. It looks like coming from a big distance. Hong, hong, big sound. When you listen to that sound, for a while you will listen to the sound like it's coming in gong, gong, like the peels of the sound. After a while, when you almost ride on the sound, it looks like hong, one of the peels is stressed out to a single sound and it will not look like a bell anymore. The same bell sound becomes like the continuous sound what the yogis call the Om sound. It is continuous Om. Actually, it is one single peal of the big bell sound. So these variations take place as we go within the same sound modifies itself. There are different sounds. And you will notice after the bell sound, that is the first real pulling sound. Before that, the sounds do not pull us. We have to listen to them. But this kind of a sound with a resonance starts pulling us and holding us. You should listen to any continuous sound that you can. The rhythm will come by itself. Any other question? Yes. I don't know whether I understood it correctly, but did you say everyone in this room will be initiated in this lifetime? I said everyone in this room will be initiated. She asked in this life, I said yes. <laughs> okay. Every person gets their own answer. All right. Any other question? Yes. Previously, I heard you speak about intuition, the God in our intuition. When, say, say someone is talented in music or art or spiritual things, does that mean they have an intuitive perception of these things that make them understand the music? That's right. That's right. Intuitively, they know those subjects. Yes. What's the question? Well, <laughs> I can't describe the sound myself. <laughs> so, so you can move on to the question. <laughs> I was just wondering if um, there's a sound that goes beyond the gong. Oh yes. Oh yes, yes. A lot of them. This is the beginning, first sound. The gong is the very first sound. Then there's a continuous sound. Then there's a sound which looks like a flute sound, very thin flute sound. Then there are so many other sounds. Uh, a series of sounds come. Beyond that. So this is uh, not the final. This is the beginning. Yes. Is the one sort of like, uh, like when you see Niagara Fall and you roar the fall and you sort of get lost in the sound? You know what I'm talking about? About being lost in the sound? Well, it's all loud. It's like being right next to Niagara Falls. It's like, <laughs> so you don't like it? Yeah, I like it. Keep it. Keep it.
Don't tell too many people how loud it is. Okay. Keep it. It will help. It will grow with you. Grow with meditation. Anybody else? Any last question? Yes. The ocean sound. Uh, what stage is that ocean sound? In, in the beginning. It's one of the ten what we call practice sounds. It comes in the beginning. Okay, now that sound, it can you just, without meditation, just like you going about doing your work or whatever, and you, you hear it like yes. the ocean is right exactly. here. Right here. Right. You hear it all the time without meditation. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed uh, being with you in this workshop. I hope you enjoy it too and it will be beneficial and uh, give you more happiness. Uh, if you live according to the values of the spiritual path, uh, you will find people around you will be different. They will change. But if you uh, live with too much thinking and the mind preoccupies you, you will find the usual problems in this world. If you live with your spirit, and live with the, the love and devotion that comes with the spiritual life, you will find other people will change. And you will wonder why. They don't know about us. Why have they changed? But they do. Best of luck to you. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to all.